Okay, I think we're live here. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. My name is Jamie Jam, the CEO and founder of Bottleneck Distant Assistance. And uh, we're here to help stop the bottleneck in your business and your life. I am your host here live with Bottleneck. So let me go ahead and get this intro done so I can introduce you to the one and only Deb Caviello and her new book, The CEO's Compass, Your Guide to Getting Back on Track. It's fantastic. We're going to talk all about it. Uh, so bear with us as uh, we jump into this, and uh, we'll see you back here in about 38 seconds. Welcome to Live with Bottleneck. I'm your host, Jamie J. I'm also the CEO and founder of Bottleneck Distant Assistance, where we help stop the bottleneck in your business and your life. And I am super excited to be talking with Deb Caviello. She is the author of The CEO's Compass, Your Guide to Get Back on Track. And it's going to be a lot of fun talking to her today. I want to I want to uh, put up a slide here, too, and tell you a little bit about what we're going to be talking about. Uh, Deborah is the founder of Illumination Partners LLC, and we're going to be talking about why can't everyone be a high performer? I think that's a fantastic topic. And why, oh, why um, is Deb going to help you stop the bottleneck in your business? Well, let me tell you. Uh, Deb Coviello is the founder of Illumination Partners and the host of the Drop In CEO podcast. I was very proud to be a guest on her show. It was a great time. For more than 20 years, she has been transforming businesses from within, elevating the talents of their organizations to new performance levels. Her experience has taught her to put tremendous value on people whom she considers as the heart of every business. And when hiring a consultant, Deb knows the primary goal will always be a resolution to a problem. As a drop-in CEO, Deb provides her clients with 25 plus years worth of experience and strategy in quality and operational excellence. Roles combined with her growth, uh, goals combined with her 20 years in the flavors and fragrance industry to identify, assess, and solve the issues that are preventing their business growth. Certified as Lean and Six Sigma Black Belt in process improvement, she has also developed significant leadership insights that people are your greatest tool in your toolbox. In order to deliver on her promise of offering peace of mind, she focuses on utilizing the talents of her client's team and elevating them to new levels of performance, setting them up to better serve their organization. And when she isn't transforming businesses from within, Deb is a board member of Women in Flavor and Fragrance Commerce, WFFC, an avid curler with the Cincinnati Curling Club, and mother of three and resides in Cincinnati, Ohio, with her husband, Dan, of 32 years. And so without any further ado, please allow me to introduce you to the one and only Deb Caviello. How are you, Deb? Hey, I am doing great. And especially with that music that you had going in there, it just got me going. I got all kinds of energy for our conversation today. <laughs> yeah, I had a little problem on YouTube when I first got that. They were saying, hey, I, you know, this is trademarked or registered or, you know, owned by. So I had to give them my license and all that kind of stuff to put it in there because we purchased the license for the music. Mm -hmm. But we loved it so much. We, we just, it, it's just exactly what you said. It's a real good feel good music. <laughs> I, I said, I'm feeling good and I am ready for this conversation, Jay, Jamie. Well, fantastic. Well, I guess to get started for people that may not know you, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your background. I went over it in the bio a little bit there, but maybe you can kind of elaborate that and maybe what you're up to now. Well, thank you for all of that. Thank you for that fantastic intro. I might just start with the end and then go backwards a little bit. Where I am now, I have the good fortune of being in my own business and creating the drop-in CEO brand. Yes, you can call me a business advisor or a consultant, but it's so crowded. There's so many of them out there. I knew I had to differentiate myself. And so 
drop in CEO brand. We drop into businesses and partner with C-suite leaders who are going through some kind of rapid transformation. And so we partner together. We solve that business problem using my expertise, as you said, quality, OpEx. I've got a database of people that I bring in. But ultimately, it's to elevate the capability of your people because when you pull out the drop-in CEO, the people have to sustain the business and carry out the work that they do. So that's my brand. That's my promise. And love, love, love the work clients that I have now, love podcasting and meeting people like you. But prior to that, I've always been in manufacturing and operations, a biomedical engineer in training, but always then moved into the the quality arena. So I make sure that we ship good product to our customers on time, protect the brand. But in recent years, when I went into the food industry, the flavors industry, food safety became a big deal. And oh my, I had to make sure we don't kill people. We had to protect the supply chain. Protect <laughs> That's a good food. thing, right? <laughs> I know, I know. But talk about the burden of responsibility. So talk about needing a lot of subject matter experts, but also people that had capability and confidence to do the work. So that's kind of the backstory of where I've been. A lot of experience, but can't wait to share some more stories with you. Yeah, you know, I was reading through uh, your book here, and thank you so much for sending me a copy. My pleasure. I even got an autograph copy. That's pretty cool. Um, and I was reading through it, and and um, I wonder if uh, I want to talk a little a little bit about this. I also want to make sure that we address the topic that we're talking about today on why can't everyone be a high performer? But I I I think a lot of that is in the CEO's compass here because there's a lot of things that I could identify with this in this book. Um, some times where imposter syndrome might come into play, or I'm trying to do, trying to become a better leader, but I get stuck in the, you know, the trenches, so to speak. And how do I get out of that? And oh my gosh, it's hard to confide in, you know, your team sometimes or in with your spouse, or sometimes you just need to talk with somebody to kind of get out of your own way a little bit. And it's, you know, it's not easy being uh, a leader. It's just not easy. And so um, I, I like that you say CEO's compass, by the way. Um, I am all about uh, direction. Now, clarity is something, oh my gosh, I, I would be so fortunate to understand and achieve clarity. But instead of striving, it's almost like striving for perfection. It's for, in my mind, it's setting yourself up for failure if you're trying to be perfect. In much the same way, if I'm trying for clarity, um, I may be setting myself up for failure, but if I have a direction, I feel so much better because if you think you're going to go to this town on the other side of this mountain, right? You need to get to that town and resupply or whatever it is. The problem is when you're going up that mountain, you can see the mountain. You can't see what's on the other side of it, but you can't see all the the, creek, the creeks or the, the rocks or the boulders that you might have to go around as you're navigating your way up and over this mountain. So that's why I'm, I really hold on to direction. And as long as I have a direction, I feel really good about that. It's almost the reason why I don't like assigning myself goals. I assign myself objectives um, because it just keeps one foot kind of going in the other. That's at least the way I'm looking at it. So this title resonated with me like there's no get out. So I wonder if maybe you could talk a little bit about your book and and you know why you wrote it. So I sincerely appreciate that visual representation of what the book is intended to do, because you're exactly right. We have goals, we have our objectives, but sometimes even the best of us, when conditions change, an acquisition, a loss of a leader, new customer requirements, what was a clear objective where you had clarity, again, clarity, not necessarily perfection, clarity, because unless if you're striving for, for perfection, but you don't have the clarity of what you need to do to get there, it's not sustainable. And so times will get foggy. And when things change and a leader is not sure what to do because they've been successful in the past, they pull out the compass. And it's really about, one, making sure the leader is right and clear in what they're trying to do. Are they leading for the right reason? 
and how do they lead? And if they're not getting the desired result, how to lead differently. And then only then after I tell them to put the book down a couple of times and think about what I said, then I say, okay, start looking at the landscape. And it's the seven compass points that I have found in my experience that if you pull on one or pull on two, it starts getting you back to true north or north, getting you back to clarity and getting to the outcomes you want. I had to write the book because I had so many thoughts in my mind. I was putting stuff on LinkedIn and people said, you know, we love what you do, but we don't know what you're about. And so mm. it wasn't clear for others what I stood for, who was I, the brand, and what was my framework for going in and serving others. And so it all came together over much reflection, a couple different visuals, a house, um, et cetera. It landed on a compass. And I think that resonates with leaders. Like you said, sometimes you're off track and you just need to pull out the compass, look at where true north is and just start getting back on track. So it's personal development wrapped up with a how to, to get you back on track, sometimes in days, not months. So that's why I wrote the book and that's what it's meant to do. Well, thank you for writing the book. And uh, I, um, as an author myself, I know the journey of writing a book is is trying, yes. to say the least at times. Really? It's such a reward <laughs> when you hit that finish line. But are you really ever finished writing that book? Well, let's just say the first book is done. And oh, now I'm waiting. Yeah. <laughs> You're never wow. done. Oh my, when I had to put this thing together, I actually have a video on LinkedIn where I had post-it notes all over the floor in my mother's home where I was staying at the time, hundreds of post-it notes, and I had to distill it down under coaching. And I found a guide, I found a compass that told me you do have to write it to one audience, hence the CEO's compass. But it does pertain to emerging leaders, mid-career professionals who are aspiring to that C-suite level to start making those course corrections and of course, the, the senior leader. I wrote the book. I put my best content in there. Now I am waiting for the universe to say, Deb, that was good. Give us more. And this is what we want. So stay tuned. There will be more. Not sure what it is yet, but I'm listening to see what people want more of. Well, I think I think that's fantastic. Uh, you know, I was talking with my publisher, uh, uh, Professor Eric Custer. He's amazing. And he was sharing with me, uh, you know, some of the insights and he really liked the genre that we picked, you know, and, and that and towards the end, you know, he was like, OK, what's your next book going to be? And I said, oh, <laughs> let's get this one out <laughs> first and let me take a little breather from this because uh, writing is a challenge for me. But I, I think I did it for the same reasons. Um, I, I was getting a lot of similar questions and I wanted to answer them. Uh, and so I basically just answered all the questions in my book and I was fortunate enough to meet a lot of other people that, you know, gave me some wonderful feedback. And that's, that was the journey here with your journey in the CEO's compass. You talk about seven different points and I'm wondering if maybe you can give us a couple things that, um, might help people that are watching this today or watching it as a replay that might be able to kind of help them out, obviously go buy the book. But maybe there's some points in the book that you can highlight that might give them a little sense to what they could expect by reading it. So thank you for that there. Like I say, total in total, there are eight compass points with peace of mind being true north, because ultimately, and I will challenge leaders, they sometimes think they are seeking results, but they're actually in pursuit of peace of mind. Because results are short lived, and sometimes you get the results and you high five. And other times, when you're on a roller coaster and you don't get the results, they grind their people into the ground until they can get the result. And I wonder then, did they have the right foundation and were they all aligned on the other compass points? When really they should be asking their team to align on a purpose to get to peace of mind. So, peace mm -hmm. of mind is the northernmost compass point, and I will just dwell on two of them. Absolute do not pass go. You do need a purpose because unless a leader can articulate the purpose of why we exist, people can't align behind that. But on the other side of the compass, there is a performance compass point. They usually play into each other. Typically, leaders will say performance. Oh, that's my results. That's my quality, my service, my uh, manufacturing expenses, etc. We need to get those results. And if we don't, we're going to work harder. I think differently. 
those are lagging indicators. They're the results of what you do. And people will do anything to get those results. Performance is actually, once you look at the purpose of the organization, then you need to go to every position in the organization and say, one, do you understand it? And do you understand your role relative to that performance? And then the second question you need to ask as a leader, then what do you need to be able to achieve that purpose? And any gaps in your capability or capacity to be able to do that, then become the things that you work on to close the gaps for the individuals. And those are leading indicators of are people going to achieve the performance and the outcome. Case in point, we want to be number one in customer service. Your salespeople, your customer service people get that. But what about the inventory person in the production area that they can't get what they need to people to the left and the right of them. And they don't know how to communicate. They don't understand what good customer service is. What are the gaps? You need to understand why they can't serve the internal customers because the external ones will. So a leader's primary responsibility is to assure that the performance of every function is aligned with the purpose and they have the opportunity to be successful. If you don't work on those two compass points at the same time, you're never going to get to peace of mind. That's just two yeah. of them. I, I like that peace of mind. Uh, would some people, do you think, in some way, shape, or form, you talk about purpose? Yeah. Would that be vision? It is. I mean, there's so many things. It's like basically we're going here. We're going here, and I'm not going to worry about if this month we don't get the result. We're going here because it, what it really means is asking people the right question. Like if you say, I want to be number one in customer service, people will do anything they can to get the numbers. If you ask people a different question, and this is our purpose, we want to be the favorite. What do we need to do to be the favorite in the industry? Which is quite different. It's about Very building different. trust, trust, brand loyalty. And then you ask people, what would it take to be the favorite? And then you ask people for their creativity and their minds and engage in the process versus saying we're going to be number one and they only default to a transaction. Engaging people with a purpose brings their minds to the table. You know what? You just nailed something that I'm a, one, a massive fan of, and that's creating a positive company culture. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe you can have a positive company culture unless everybody understands what that vision or that purpose is. And they are empowered to act on that vision. They actually believe in that vision. Now, they may have different opinions along the way, which I absolutely love, but I also think that their voice uh, being heard literally empowers them to, you know what? Numbers are important, right? I know. I think we can all agree. Numbers are important. That's, that's how we put food on the table. However, there's... And I like the word that you chose specifically, different way about going about this. And, and instead of being so number driven business, you know, I, I hate aligning that with corporate. That's been in my experience because I know people love corporate America and great, good for them. But we were so numbers driven in the industry, in the company that I was involved with. It was, it was a little bit of a turnoff because I didn't really, I felt like a number. I really felt like a number and I didn't. I think that even my performance was there, but I wasn't really there. You know, I, I was like, when it was the end of the day, I was like, all right, it's time to go home. Or in the morning, I was like, oh, I got to go to work. I didn't like that feeling. Now today, I'm like, I get to go to work. <laughs> like, I get to go to work. Um, and it's fun, but it's because I think we have a really solid foundation, cultural foundation. Um, can you talk to that at all? Well, I mean, the other thing I want to talk about is that the CEO's compass is applicable to business, but it is also a guide for the individual as well. You do need to dig down and understand what your purpose is. And so I used to think, oh, I fo followed the corporate ladder. I made a good salary, got a bonus. I was able to handle a lot of the personal finances. And so you feel good about that. But amidst that, towards the end of my corporate career, I was under so much stress. I was working so many hours. The money was no longer worth it and giving me peace of mind. I said, something has to change. And so I had the good fortune of transitioning out of corporate. And now my purpose is to connect with humanity and give people the time back that they need to spend time doing the things they need to do. And while my revenue goals are not where they need to be right now, and I'm a little bit uncomfortable this quarter, 
I know that by having this connection with humanity, with you and your audience and sharing our insights, if we can impact one or many, that's the purposeful work. If we can help somebody to be a little bit more effective, work a few hours and be with their family, their community or what they want to do, that's really the purpose. So you can use this book also for yourself. I love that. And, and, and quite frankly, um, if a CEO uh, is obviously leading an organization, in my opinion, uh, the right way, uh, they fully believe in that purpose, that vision. They fully believe on it. And, and if they're doing things right, in my opinion, again, the team believes in that same purpose. And that, that example that you used, yeah, sure. Customer service people. Yep. They want to be great in customer service sales. They want to be great. But what about that person? Uh, you know, in, in the, you know, in inventory, making sure that the, you know, everything is getting out right. Maybe the box isn't all wrecked up, you know, before it ships out or just having that little extra care um, about how, you know, they're, they take their role. I think it's so important. You know, you and I are right here right now. We could be anywhere in the world. We've chosen to be here right now. And the fact that we're so intentional with our time, and I hope it's okay that I include you with that because it's a feeling I'm feeling, but I feel it's the same. If you're doing something, why not give it your all, what it, whatever you're doing? Absolutely. I mean, just a little case in point here, about 12 months ago, I would be showing up here on this interview saying, hello, my name is Deb Covey Allo. I am an expert in Six Sigma and Lean Six Sigma and whatever. And I would be just very stoic. And my mentor, Peter Goral, said to me, just, just get over it, be yourself. And so now I show up as myself. I occasionally flub up my words. My hair may not be in the right place. I'm not perfect, but oh my, I am enjoying such amazing <laughs> conversations with you, getting to know you, your audience, learning from you, and perhaps sharing my experiences with your audience as well. That's the great fun that we get to have right now. I don't strive for perfection, but clarity and helping me on my journey is what I need. I love it. F f fantastic. So why can't everyone be a high performer? Yeah. So I'll ask you that. Why can't they? Because <laughs> I have been in corporate and the first thing you do at mid, you know, at the end of the year is, okay, you've got all your employees. We got a nine box and you either have to put people in the uppermost corner, high performer, high potential and people in the bottom, let, you know, the other corner, uh, they should be on a performance improvement plan. And, uh, we should be thinking about what we need to do to exit and have succession planning, or it may be the bell shaped curve. And that's the exercise we are told that we have to do every year. But I have to ask you a question when you hire a new employee. Do you say, okay, you're going to be in the middle. Okay, we're going to hire you to be on the top. And oh, okay, well, don't, don't put too much on your table, your desk right now. You're going to be gone because you're going to be a poor performer. And so I ask you, as leaders, why do we allow the narrative to be that at a particular time we have to box people, one, in all three of those categories now? Yes, certain people will get more results. Certain people will have more charisma and get things done. Yes, there is a spectrum. What we need to do as leaders is, okay, yes, there may be different levels of performance, but we let people be. We invest in hiring people and we just let them be and hope and expect, and maybe we'll send them out to training that they'll get the skills that they need along the way. And what I propose to you is, first of all, watch out for your high performers. If you don't feed their soul, give them feedback on what they're doing well and what's the next thing they can be doing, they're going to drop down to being just an average employee because they live for the improvement and the action. And if you don't feed their soul, they're going to drop down to be an average performer. So again, it's on the leader to make sure you have a framework to feed that energy. And then the person that's a steady in the middle, we just let them be because they're loyal. They get the transaction done. We let them be and we'll keep them in a box. And there's no need to move them anywhere to be a high performer because they get the job done. They're happy there. But have we ever asked them the question, what do you think about this? And bring their years of experience forward and say, you know, let's develop that idea. And then the next thing you know, they may be a trainer on a new initiative. They could be a high performer. And then I ask you and challenge you, anybody that you say is a poor performer, you have to look inside and ask why. 
Did we not put them in the right position? Did we ever ask them, do you have everything you need to be successful? We don't, as leaders, ask hard questions. Ask them, do you have everything you need to be successful? It's a really powerful question because you may find the person is not getting the feedback, the guidance, the tools that they need. And maybe they have ideas about how to get better and they can move up the ladder and be a steady eddy. But when we don't invest in these people, and again, invest for the future, they leave the business because we are lazy. We don't ask the right questions and we assume there's poor performers and just steady eddies. But I challenge you, give them the time, ask them the questions, ask them to think and contribute. They could all be high performers. I love that. Is that Again, too much? <laughs> no. But it's, I feel I am so passionate about it. It's well, so you're giving them a voice, which in turn empowers them. Yeah. And it, it makes them feel like, wow, I'm more than just a number here. They really want to know what I think. And and I'm a, I'm I'm the first person that will slap a high five uh to any leader that uh creates a dialogue like this or or maintains an open dialogue. I think one of the biggest challenges we have is what you said. We, um, I, and I go back to my corporate, okay, here's your quota, get it done. You, my very first, this, this was my training, my very first day, and this is dating me, but this is my very first day of training because I was in a sales position. I had to open up the yellow pages. We were literally in a room with a dozen other salespeople calling going down a list and calling people. It was brutal. That was our training. Um, and I think that's probably, you know, this old school kind of bullpen type stuff and like boiler room, the sales stuff from that movie boiler room. And boy, I just, it was just such a turnoff. Now, um, what we do is we create a role and responsibilities for an, an opportunity that we may need filled. Uh, we're growing companies, we're finding new positions and all of that. I've learned this from a good friend of mine, David Trainer Khan, and he says when he hires somebody, he only looks to hire them for 75% of the tasks that he needs them to complete. Yeah. And many people want 100% of those or they're not a good fit. And I don't think, I, I love this because that other 25%, be ready to get amazed by where they really excel and what I do once a year, every January, it's coming up here pretty soon as of the time of this recording, every single person on my team redefines their job role and their responsibilities. Throughout the year, things change a little bit and people start showing a little bit more, you know, a little bit more oomph, a little bit more vote motivation. They're getting things done a little bit more creatively, maybe on this thing that we really didn't hire them for in the first place, but maybe we can move them into something that really, really, really helps them um, feel good about what they're doing. And everybody likes feeling good about their, what they're doing. They love being in a position to where they excel. And what's wrong with moving people around like that? In my opinion, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Uh, I think it, it kind of lets them feel even empowered more because they get to go, I get to write my own responsibilities? You mean, I can do what I want here? <laughs> I just That's think it's awesome. But the beauty of what you said was basically job descriptions are lagging indicators. Yes, you have to check the box to get the talent that you think that you need, but you also have to be thinking about what do you need for the future. It might be better to say these are the outcomes we're looking to achieve and not worry about the individual functions because as the outcomes change based on the changing goals in the environment, people are going to have to develop new skills. Then people sometimes will revert to, oh, I can't do that. This is not in my job description. Or... You know, you have to do things to say, okay, it, forget about the job description. I need you to do this because businesses are constantly changing like that so much. So you're right. I was once not brought into a company because they couldn't check the box on a couple of my qualifications. And guess what? Six months later, they called me back because they needed to me to solve a crisis. And the fact that I couldn't check the box on everything was not so important. So you got to be careful as an employer. The job descriptions are great to, for hiring, but they can also lock you in from potentially getting really great talent. Oh, you you nailed it. 
You absolutely nailed it. I couldn't agree more. So what are some of the things that you can do? Where is someone at in their organization uh, where they might say, you know what, it's time for me to reach out to Deb, um, the drop-in CEO, because bah. So the ideal person that is attracted to the work that I do is usually a C-suite leader, the CEO or the CEO, who is at a spectrum of transformation. And when I say that, you could be in crisis, on the verge of recall, losing customers. You could be in firefighting mode, not losing customers. Or maybe you're the highly aware leader that you're in control now, but you see the writing on the wall that things are changing and you don't have the capability and capacity. For example, an acquisition of a, of a company, a loss of a senior leader in an organization and you can't replace them. The integration of people from organizations or a new customer requirement that you never had to have before, but if you don't get it, they're gonna take you off the core supplier list and you have to move quick because that is top line growth. Those are points of inflection where a leader starts feeling pain because the current people in the organization don't know how or you don't have the capacity to get there. So in comes the drop in CEO, you get the best of my experience or the people I know. We solve the business problem, but often we find a greater opportunity. Fix the problem, elevate the people, their confidence, their ability to influence, pull me out, and they can sustain. So an example of this, just so you know, is I was brought into a company. They needed a certification. Okay, I can check the box and get you your documentation, pass the audit. But in the process, they realized they had such a senior workforce and nothing was written down. If one person left the organization, you have a risk. You don't have redundancy. You don't have succession planning. Their eyes lit up that we need processes and standards because as soon as we grow and bring in new talent, we need to be able to sustain the processes and not rely on individuals. That's what the drop-in CEO brand can do for you is open your eyes up to not what you see now, but where you need to go. So that, that's the situation I fit perfectly into. Do something as if it's the last time you're ever going to do it. Document, document, document. Yes. Not to kill people and, and restrict them, but just, it could be a flow chart, a picture, just take pictures, uh, push this button and that screenshot, make it simple so that people can understand and do something repeatedly and maybe train others. Well, this is this is fantastic. Um, I know I know we've hit the half hour mark, so I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, but before before we go, um, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you? So the easiest way, and first of all, Jamie, thank you so much for this opportunity. I love the engaging conversation here, but it's quite simple. Drop in CEO, D-R-O-P-I-N-C-E-O dot com. Go to my website. You can get everything of what I have to offer. You'll get an overview of my services, how to get the book, the CEO's compass, my blogs, and even set up some time. And let's just have a conversation and get to know each other. And you never know, maybe we'll be able to work together. So thank you. Oh, you are welcome. Thank you. And is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap? No, just, this has been a great interview. I just truly enjoy the friendship, the networking. I think if nothing else, everybody should be reaching out to humanity, pick up the phone, do the networking, connect with people, learn from others. That's how we're all going to survive this crisis and the next. So just thank you for the opportunity to connect with your audience. You are so welcome. Here's the book. It is the CEO's Compass, Your Guide to Get Back on Track by Deborah Coviello. You can go to her website, dropinceo.com to learn more. I'll go ahead and put it up on the screen again. Go check it out. Uh, it's worth a phone call. It really is. Um, so, uh, Deb, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you had some internet uh, challenges and for you to, to overcome that and hop on and still on time just uh, is amazing. So speaks volume to your character. And so thank you so much. All right. And I wish you continued success. Thank you so much. Awesome. Can you hold on one second and I'll wrap up? Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, so I've been talking with Deb Coviello. She is the drop-in CEO. Seriously, go check out the site, dropinceo.com. And I cannot recommend enough 
get Deb's book, The CEO's Compass, Your Guide to Get Back on Track. It really does have a lot of good tips in there. It's a quick read. Uh, I know a lot of CEOs that you're just so busy. One more book, this should be on your reading list. Uh, go check it out, The CEO's Compass. Uh, you can go to dropinceo.com uh, to learn more. Uh, again, I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, we have been talking about why can't everyone be a higher performer? Um, and we listed out a bunch of different things. Uh, number one, purpose. Number two, performance. Those are two of the eight different uh, compass metrics that are spoken about. So definitely go check it out, the CEO's Compass. Uh, thank you so much to Deb Coviello uh, for joining us today. If you want to see more videos like this, you can learn how to break through the bottleneck in your business today by going to bottleneck.online slash BTV. That'll give you some good examples of some of the other guests that we've had here on uh, Live with Bottleneck. It is a lot of fun. We should, we also do some other cool things, like some of the stuff that you, you might not even think about. Like we got some uh, custom-made shoes that say Bottleneck on them, and we just do little goofy things like that, and we have a lot of fun with it. Uh, if you don't know, you can go to quitrepeatingyourself.com. Check out my new book, Quit Repeating Yourself, How Today's Leaders Are Using Systems and Processes to Grow Their Business the Right Way. Quit repeating yourself.com. And we're also supporting uh, Team C's Challenge. And you can go to teamc's.org. As many of you know, I'm a massive fan of cleaning up pollution. Uh, I don't like I don't like littering. I don't like any of that. And we our our seas are just riddled with plastic and garbage. And this uh, you can go learn more by going to teamc's.org. They're looking at raising $30 million. And for each dollar, they're going to clean up one pound of trash from our oceans, rivers, and beaches. To date, since this is launched on the 20, I think it was the 29th of October, they've already um, uh, raised over $15 million. And this is going through January 1st, midnight of January 1st, where we hope to achieve that goal. So go help and support. You can learn more by going to teamseas.org. I think it's a fantastic opportunity. If you missed last episode, I talked to the one and only Gordon McDougall. We call him Gord. He's a CEO of Tezzy Advisory. We've talked about the three different types of businesses, the small business owner, the lifestyle business, or building for scale. Uh, he's over 30 years experience uh, in finance and growing companies, acquiring companies, selling companies. It was a really, really great and, um, and insightful conversation. So go check that out. And coming soon, I'm going to be talking with Paul Benegeri. He's the co-founder at CEO at Archive. We're going to be talking about building scalable and profitable influencer marketing campaigns. That's coming up Tuesday, November 30th at 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern. And really look forward to uh, that conversation. So please join us then. Uh, without any further ado, we'll go ahead and wrap up for today. Thank you so much uh, for helping us. Uh, here at Live with Bottleneck. And uh, hopefully this will help you stop the bottleneck in your business and your life. And one final time, thank you so much to Deborah Coviello. She's a founder of Illumination Partners. Why can't everyone be a high performer? Go to dropinceo.com today to learn more about that. And I just want to say thank you. And remember, create your own ripple. Have a fantastic day.